Hey, what's good YouTube? Solmas here, back with another video. I know you're thinking, two vids a week, that's crazy. I'm not sick, I promise. Consider it my Christmas present to all of you wonderful people. Jokes aside though, this will probably be my last Mage Tower video for now, unless I decide to have a go at any of the other ones. Personally, I really just wanted to complete the pod and end the Druid Challenge. So here we are, with the Guardian Druid Challenge. I know I'm rather late to the party with this week being the last week of the Mage Tower, but I still wanted to push out this guide for those of you who still might be struggling, or for those of you who just like me want to absorb as many pointers and information as possible to prepare themselves for this challenge. Real quick, I just want to say I really really appreciate the support on the last video. If you guys enjoyed this one, feel free to leave a like, sub to the channel, or drop a comment to let me know how well you fared, and if this guide was any helpful to you at all. So let's dive straight in, and start by addressing the elephant in the room. Gear. I had a fair few people ask me on the Holy Paladin video what gear I used. Even though I did mention I was just using Shadowlands gear. But anyways, this time around, that definitely wasn't the case however. Before the Mage Tower, I hadn't even hovered this button before. So I wanted to make sure that I had every possible advantage I could get before I even started. As a general rule of thumb, you want to be looking for sub 50 item level gear with one or multiple sockets on it. This is because the stat scaling is completely whack inside the mage tower, especially for primary stats. Starting with my helm, I was lucky enough to find a fairly cheap one with a meta socket and a regular socket, which I equipped with an agile primal diamond for free extra agility and 3% increased crit effect, as well as a delicate screen garnet for another 4 agility. For my neck, I found this random level 48 necklace with a socket on it, equipped it with a queen's garnet and enchanted it with mark of the hidden satyr. Another really solid option is using the Heart of Azeroth from BFA. Next up, the shoulders are crafted ones with a socket, fitted with another Queen's Garnet, and enchanted with the Greater Tiger Claw inscription for 5 agility and 2 crit. Cloak is just a random one I found on the auction house, enchanted with minor power for a plus 6 increase to primary stats. Another solid option is the Legendary Cloak from BFA. As for enchants, you could also use Fortified Leech. Two sockets on a crafted chest enchanted with plus 30 primary stats and fitted with a queen's garnet and a saber's eye for plus 6 agility. Another really really solid option for chest, shoulders, helm and legs if you want to save out on some gold is buying benthic pieces with mana pearls from Najatar as they will provide you with a ton of primary stats. Same thing with dauntless gear pieces from nether shards on the broken shore. Wrists are random ones I got off the auction house enchanted with greater agility for plus 5 to agility. If you've done any legion content on your druid you should also have access to the dream grove wrists which come with a socket for only 250 gold. Gloves are random, you get the point by now. The enchant is either superior or major agility for a plus 6 or a plus 18 agility increase. I managed to find a belt with one socket already on it, but if you don't, it's not really a big issue as you can still add a socket to your belt with a living steel belt buckle. The gems I fit in are the Leviathans and a Kraken's Eye for plus 7 and plus 6 agility respectively. My legs I enchanted with Shadow Ladder Leg Armor for plus 6 agility and free crit and fit it with a Nightmare Tear for plus 4 to all stats and a Queen's Garnet. Boots are enchanted with Eternal Agility for a plus 15 increase, and fit it with a Queen's Garnet. For the rings I'd recommend just going with the Shadowlands crafted rings as they naturally come with a gem socket. I enchanted mine with Tenets of Versatility, and put Shadowlands first gems on them. The trinkets I used are the Ravage Seed bought from Nefendra and Eternal Nightmare. You can farm this trinket on Normal, Heroic, Mythic as well as LFR by talking to the mage standing outside of Violet Hold and the unblinking gaze of Seth from Shadow Lord Ishgar in Hellfire Citadel. This trinket drops on normal, heroic, and mythic difficulty. You shouldn't have to set your loot spec because of legacy loot, but if you want to make sure, then set your loot spec to Feral for the Seed Pot and Balance for the Gaze of Seth. Other notable mentions are the Blood Splattered Scale from the other side, and the Ghost Iron Dragonling which you should be able to get from the Auction House, and comes with free special socks that you can fit with Tinker's gear. Lastly, I just want to touch upon my weapons real quick. I highly recommend using the Legion Guardian Artifact weapons since you can actually use oils and enchants on both of them, resulting in a ton of extra damage. If you don't have them, you can easily get them just by starting the Legion Expansion questline and doing a handful of quests leading up to it. If you want to increase their item level, you can do so by equipping them with relics which you get from raids, dungeons and world quests in Legion. The enchants I used on my weapons are Force Multiplier and Lightless Force. Other good options are Celestial Guidance and Sinful Revelation. The oil I used on both is Shadow Core. Ok, so moving on to talents, my setup was fairly basic. Brambles provides a good bit of extra DPS whenever you use Barkskin, which in my case wasn't a whole lot, but you definitely should. 
Wild Charge is a tremendous lifesaver and saves you on Goblin Gliders. Trust me, the heal from Renewal is not necessary whatsoever. Balance Affinity is our biggest source of damage to push Phase 1 as fast as we can, and we do that in combination with Heart of the Wild. Galactic Guardian will give you a bunch of free passive DPS as well as a ton of extra DPS whenever you get a Moonfire proc. Survival of the Fittest is pretty straightforward. It lowers the cooldown of Barkskin, which in turn synergizes with Brambles. And lastly, Rendant here for some extra damage as well as some damage reduction. The consumables I used were Greater Current Flasks, Stake a la Mode for food, Heavy Armor Kits, War Scrolls of Fortitude and Battle Shout, Current Augment Runes, and Potions of Unbridled Fury. The Fury Potions are especially nice as you can see from the damage breakdown. If you have spare ones, you can even use Potion right before you enter the tower. This will give you about 25 seconds of potion time while resetting your global potion CD for a second use later on. Other than that, I also use Drums of Deathly Ferocity, but you can just use the older ones as well. Okay, so before we move on to the actual fight breakdown, I want to go over some macros that were extremely useful for me in this fight. First off is a really simple focus mouse over macro. This will make anything you're mousing over your current focus target. That was useful for the following skull bash macro, which will automatically skull bash your focus target. This means you can still target swap while interrupting Varus in a pinch as long as he's your focus target. I also use the Moonfire mouse over macro to deal with the eyes without having to swap away from Varus. And lastly, I made a macro that bundled all of my consumables in one, along with Pop and Berserk. And in hindsight, I realized that I also could have used the troll racial on top of it, so keep in mind that those do exist. <laughs> There's also a link to the weak aura that shows infernal spawn timers, etc. in the description down below. Okay, so with that out of the way, I can finally take a deep breath and first address the inevitable comments that will point out that you can do this challenge perfectly without any of this gear, trinkets, blindfolded while helping an old lady cross the road, and to them I will say... You're right. But I suck. <laughs> so every bit of help was welcome. Now, time for the fight breakdown. This fight exists of two phases. Phase 1 has you fight against Varus, a fairly passive guy with a big AoE aura around him. Getting inside Varus' AoE will build up stacks that decrease your stamina. Varus will also continuously cast Mindrend. You don't have to worry about this whatsoever, unless you have 5 plus stacks of Aura of Decay. The kicker here is Drain Life. You want to interrupt this cast as soon as possible, otherwise Varus is just going to heal back up very quickly. Use Skull Bash to interrupt or Typhoon if you're comfortable staying in Boonkin form and pushing damage. Throughout this phase you'll have 3 different types of adds that'll spawn. First is the eyes. These eyes will knock you back a significant distance if you aren't looking directly at them when their cast goes off. These eyes aren't a big deal if you moonfire them immediately as they spawn. A single early moonfire cast should kill them before they get theirs off. Next up you have an infernal spawning about every minute or so I think. These infernals have a pulsating AoE effect around them that does a ton of damage and damages them as well. You want to stay away from them as they will also cast a smash on the ground that you need to get out of if you don't want to get launched across the platform. And lastly, every 30 seconds or so there will be a bunch of nether horrors spawning in. These nether horrors will always go for Velen in phase 1. A quick way to round them up is by casting regrowth shortly before they spawn in. The heal over time effect will immediately cause them to aggro onto you. These horrors will also cast nether storm. This ability needs to be interrupted ASAP. Otherwise, it will deal massive amounts of AoE damage around him. Keep your incapacitating roar for Netherstorm as it lines up nicely with the horror spawn time. One interrupt should also be enough to prevent any storm casts from going off before they all die. Our goal in phase 1 is to burn down Varus as quickly as possible before too many infernal spawn in, and make our life a lot harder in the next phase. When you kill Varus, Cruel will come down and take his place. Cruel is this big, roided up demon guy with 3 abilities. Annihilate, which we'll cover in a minute. Twisted Reflection, which needs to be interrupted immediately, otherwise you're done for. Cruel will cast this after the first and third Annihilate. And Nether Stomp, which has Cruel Leap on top of you and drop a puddle of green goo that slows you down. The Eyes of Phase 1 will no longer bother you in Phase 2. However, the Horrors will keep spawning, so keep an eye open for when they do. No new Infernals will rain down in Phase 2, but you will go into Phase 2 with the amount of Infernals that you had in Phase 1. New in Phase 2 are these purple beams that travel across the platform. They will drag you along if you get caught in them, however, you can just jump over them. Lastly, let's talk about Cruel's Annihilate. 
Krul will cast this right around every 15 to 20 seconds or so. Annihilate will deal 110% more damage with every cast. You will need to assign your cooldowns respectively for each one. The first one doesn't deal a whole lot of damage yet, so you can easily take it with just an iron fur. The second one will deal a ton more damage, and I'd recommend saving Bark Skin for that one. The third Annihilate, I recommend using Survival Instincts, and if you do end up getting a fourth one, you should probably use Bark Skin and your second charge of Survival Instincts and pray that you live through it. Don't forget, you can also just easily set up your UI in any way that reminds you of this defensive rotation just like I did. It definitely helped me memorize this quite a bit. Throughout phase 1 and 2, Velen will also spawn orbs that heal you back up to full health, dispel the curse you and blind any demon for 5 seconds. You shouldn't eat any in phase 1, but if you do use one either on accident or intentionally to interrupt a horse for example, that is obviously not an issue. In phase 2 you'll mainly want to use the orbs to stall out Krull's Annihilate casts. The longer you can stall, the more damage you'll get in without risking a one shot. Alright, so let's quickly go over my kill. I started off by using a potion of Unbridled Fury and entered the Mage Tower. I positioned myself right around this green triangle to stay outside of Varys' AoE range, and pop your Heart of the Wild shortly after Varys shouts not so fast and starts moving closer. Open up with Star Surge, Dot of Varys, and continue spamming Wrath. Right off the bat you'll be facing two different scenarios. In the first scenario, Varus will cast Drain Life way before the first wave of horror spawns in. If this is the case, it's best to interrupt Varus with Typhoon, since that gives you a bunch of extra time to burn him down in your Boomkin form. Scenario 2 has Varus cast Drain Life when the first wave of horror spawns in. If this happens, just regrowth yourself to aggro the horrors and skull bash Varus immediately after. Now that you're close and you got the horrors clumped up on top of him, you can go ahead and drop your seed pot for a ton of extra damage. Don't forget to use Incapacitating Roar to interrupt the Nether Storm cast. And as you can see, for me Varus casts Drain Life early so I just interrupt him with Typhoon and keep nuking him down. As soon as the eye spawns, I dot it up with a Moonfire and no longer pay any more attention to it. When the horse spawn, I throw a regrowth on myself and Wild Charge towards Varus. When the adds are clumped up on top of him, I just use my seed pot and cleave them all down. Keep dotting up the eyes as they come and don't forget to interrupt Varus' Drain Life cast. Also, keep an eye on the Infernals casting their smash, so you don't get knocked off. Here I accidentally got knocked into an orb by the eye. It's not a big deal, but it certainly wasn't intentional. It also threw me off slightly and made me miss my Typhoon, but I managed to recover and interrupt the Skull Bash. A little bit of a messy transition as another wave of horror spawns in just as Skrull comes down, but I pop my Berserk macro with all of my consumables and start trash spamming away. You'll want to kite Skrull around the edges before his Nether Stomp, and start moving towards the orbs in the middle whenever he's about to cast Annihilate. Again, you can just face tank the first one no problem, Mark skin on the second, survival instincts on the third, and prayers on the fourth. Don't be greedy with the orbs if you fall low on health, it's better to kill him with no orbs left than to die with one or two up. Don't forget that the horrors will still spawn in every now and then, so interrupt them and cleave them down on top of the boss.
And that's it. I hope this guide has been helpful to you guys. Good luck getting your fell bears. Feel free to let me know down in the comments how it went. And most of all, enjoy your holidays. Bye bye.